that uh, God is good, and we thank him for all the things that we have today. Now, today there's a story behind what we're going to talk about. The subject is the compassionate father. The story behind it is that this painting by Rembrandt, painted a year or two before his death in 1669, at least that's what most Rembrandt scholars believe it was at the very end of his life. Rembrandt was used to putting self-portraits into his paintings, and some think that he was himself the old man. He had been a kind of roustabout younger figure. He had rebelled against uh, convention and so forth and was known as that in his youth. Some think that he actually saw himself in three phases, the younger son, the elder son, and ultimately the, the father, at least in terms of the physical representation. Now, this painting hangs in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg in Russia. And there's a story that goes along with that. Some of you will have read this book by Henry Nouwen called The Return of the Prodigal. Henry Nouwen was a Dutch uh, priest in the Roman Catholic Church. In his later years, he was the chaplain of L'Arche Community in, uh, in Canada. And he wrote a number of books. I, I remember sitting in a plane once with uh, one of the Habsburg uh, next and third and fourth generation Habsburgs. And uh, he was a very devout Roman Catholic, but he had never heard of Henry Nouwen. And I said, well, Henry Nouwen's actually one of the best writers on scriptural themes that you can find. And he was delighted when I introduced him to Henry Nouwen. And I said, and he was a Catholic. Uh, but I said, every Protestant that follows good literature probably reads Henry Nouwen. This was about 15 years ago. Anyway, Henry Nouwen wrote a book called The Return of the Prodigal. And you can see the painting on the uh, cover. And as he tells the story, he went to the Hermitage in Russia specifically to sit and contemplate this painting by Rembrandt. And he wrote this book on Luke's parable of the return of the prodigal uh, after spending four to six hours sitting in front of the painting. Now, Betsy had read the book. I think she'd read it several times. And she was quite taken with it, as I was, too. It's an absolutely wonderful book. And when we were, and I was teaching in St. Petersburg, and we had a Saturday off. It was dead of winter, so there wasn't much you could do in St. Petersburg. Most of our trips to Central and Eastern Europe were in the dead of winter. So where other people went and saw um, all of the joys of summer in Eastern Europe, we only saw the winter, and the winter was pretty grim. However, the Hermitage is one of those absolute treasure troves. Catherine the Great, the German princess who became Queen of Russia, had unlimited funds, and she gathered all the great paintings of Europe and brought them into the Hermitage. And so there's an incredible collection of paintings. Anyway, I spent five hours or six hours running around the Hermitage trying to see all the paintings, and there are 20 or 30,000 of them, and I don't remember anything. Betsy did what her mentor, Henry Nouwen, had done. She got a chair, and she sat for four to six hours in front of this painting. And, con and then she reread Henry Nouwen's book. We then, in a book club that we, I'll put the painting right here, in a book club that we uh, belong to here in Ladner to Wasson, we recently took as our subject book, Henry Nouwen's The Return of the Prodigal. And so it was fresh in my mind when I was asked a couple of weeks ago on Father's Day to preach down at Point Roberts at the Calvary Chapel down there, where we sometimes attend when we're in the point. And it was Father's Day, and I thought, oh, we'll do a Father's Day message on the return of the prodigal, because the focus is really not on the sons, but on the father. And then when I was thinking about today, I thought, you know, it was a Father's Day message, but the... Father heart of God, the compassion to Father, shouldn't be limited to Father's Day. It's something we should be thinking about and how we can be transformed into the kind of Father with a compassionate heart that we see in our God. So I thought, well, I'll, I, I'll just take the same message, rework it a bit, and uh, 
uh, Martin has added Chinese to it, so we have a fully bilingual uh, PowerPoint. So that's where we're going today, and I hope you'll enjoy and appreciate the story of the prodigal son uh, and what we can learn from it, uh, even as Betsy and I have by spending time both with the parable and with the painting and with Henry Nouwen's book uh, reflecting it. By the way, the painting, as you can see immediately if you know the parable, the painting is a composite. It doesn't represent any specific scene in Luke's, Luke 15's parable but it brings together a number of things that are in the parable, specifically the father rushing out to hug and welcome his son and the elder brother. Basically, uh, although Rembrandt doesn't tell us who the characters are, we can see on the left, we can see the father grasping the younger son. We know that that's the younger son and the prodigal. Most observers of Rembrandt think that the tall figure on the on the right-hand side of the painting is the elder son, and we're going to talk about that, and you'll see the painting up on the screen when we, when we come to it. So that's where we're going today, and as I say, Betsy and I have spent hours in the last six months just contemplating and going over the whole idea of what it means to be the younger son, what it means to be the elder son, and ultimately what it might mean to be transformed into the image of a compassionate father whom we find in God our Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's think about those things today. The compassionate father, a fresh look at uh, Luke's parable from Luke 15. And by the way, I should say, some, most of you know that I have trouble reading because of eyesight. Often Jassy, who's hiding around the corner here, by the way, and running the computer, Jassy has been my reader on different occasions, but because she's tied up today, Betsy's going to read the text in English, and it will also be in Chinese, both for those here and those online uh, who find it easier to read in Chinese characters. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the resources. We, these are the three resources, basically, that we have already uh, spoken about. We have the parable itself. We have... Rembrandt's painting, and we have Henry Nouwen's very insightful book. Well, the context of the parable itself, Luke 15, again, is a well-known scriptural passage, and it consists of three parables, all of which are related. And the context of Luke 15 begins in the first verse, <coughs> where the Pharisees and the scribes and the tax collectors and the uh, all of the different secular and religious people that often crowded around Jesus were in the previous chapter, chapter 14. And chapter 14 ends and chapter 15 begins with a complaint by the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they're complaining that Jesus seemed to always to prefer the company of tax collectors and sinners to the company of religious people. And I've often wondered about that because being neither a tax collector nor a, a, what they would call a sinner, that is a non-religious person. Now we all understand that scripturally we are sinners. We have all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in the New Testament when we read about sinners, that's a specific category of people who didn't attend religious services and weren't understood as followers or observers of the law. Most of us here are not that kind of rebels against anything religious. We probably don't like the term religion, uh, which tends to, in most people's minds, to uh, refer to some kind of hypocritical system followed by the world of people who go to church with whom none of us have much to do and we don't particularly like them anyway. Uh, and so we'd prefer to sit, fit into the category of sinners in that sense. I'm speaking of the general populace around us. Most of us, by contrast, do come to church on Sunday and would be considered religious rather than secular by the world around us. However, in this uh, juxtaposition that with which chapter 15 of Luke begins, the Pharisees, the religious people, are complaining about the fact 
that Jesus preferred to talk with the non-religious crowd and he had something to say to them and they were drawn to him. One of my doctoral students in Oxford did, uh, did a study of Jesus and the undesirable people in the New Testament and uh, in his thesis he proved that Jesus had a, a constant appeal to these kinds of people, which we know about, but he also, he came from Australia, and he had studied the sort of underworld in Sydney, and he had gone, as part of his research, he had gone and sat down with all kinds of people who were disreputable characters in the underworld of Sydney, and he started presenting the gospel parables and presenting the story of Jesus to these people. And he said, it was amazing, it was just like the New Testament. They all responded to Jesus in a way that seemed even more enthusiastic in many ways than the religious people's response to Jesus. So that's the way it begins. And then Jesus tells three stories, parables or stories. He tells three stories, and the thing that each of the stories have in common is that something is lost. The first section refers to the lost sheep. There were 90 and 9 sheep. There were actually 100 sheep in the fold. One wandered out and was lost, and the shepherd leaves the 90 and 9 and goes looking for the one that's lost. And that parable concludes with, as often parables do, with a kind of, this is the point of the parable. And the point of the parable is that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 90 and 9 that never left the fold. A little bit difficult for the 90 and 9 who consider themselves a lot more obedient by not wandering out in the wilderness, but that's the way Jesus tells the parable and we have to live with it. The second story is about a coin and it's a woman. Uh, the woman has lost a coin. We've all had the experience of turning the house upside down, searching for something. Finally, she discovered it and there's incredible joy Rejoice with me, that which was lost is found, and she rejoices over the lost coin. And then the third parable is the story of the two sons, the lost son. And specifically, and the reason the parable is called the parable of the prodigal is because in the progression of those three stories, the third story is also about someone, in this case a person, who was lost, and becomes found. And the whole point when the son comes back and the father repeats it first when the, son, when, the, when the lost son comes back and then when the older brother gets into the story, he again can't help but say, look, the lost has been found. My son was dead and is alive again. We've got to have a party. We've got to celebrate because the lost has been found. So that's the general direction of Luke 15. And that's the context of the parable. However, in the painting itself, which we now look at, in the painting itself, Rembrandt has concentrated on a number of things. We certainly see the younger son, although the younger son has not been dressed in the robe and a ring on his finger and all kinds of things. The younger son is just there in his rags and the father has thrown his arm around him and, and welcomed him home. We then, of course, have the, what we believe is the elder son up on the right-hand side of the picture. And the elder son is standing, towering over the shrunken little father. The, the father looks like a wizened old man who's probably spent years of grief waiting for his son to come home. And now the son's home, but he's an old man and he's just rejoicing. But the older son has never left home and he's standing there in rich robes just like the father. And Rembrandt loved to portray rich robes. And he, Rembrandt, of course, also used light uh, to an effect that almost no painter, I think this was inspired because I don't know of any painter who has used light so effectively. And you can always read Rembrandt's paintings by seeing what he does with the light. And the color red, he loves red. And he's got the father dressed in a, ro in a red shawl and the son dressed in a red jacket. And the light is dominant on the father and it reflects over on the elder son. And so uh, in the painting you have the elder son, the younger son, and the father. And in terms of the characters that we have in the, 
<coughs> in the painting. There are a number of them, but Rembrandt, if you look at Rembrandt's painting, the focus really isn't on the younger son. The younger son is back to us. The focus isn't even on the elder son. The focus is on the father. And that's why, as Betsy and I have been contemplating this parable, uh, we, we find our attention drawn again and again and again, not to the prodigal son, but to the compassionate father. And so that's, uh, and that's how, the, how this, this parable actually begins. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. So the parable is really about the father as much, if not more, than it's about the, the prodigal son. I've actually had two paintings, the, the two pictures. They're both photographs of the, of the same painting. But in the first one, you see the light more uh, on, the, on the father and the son. And if you look at the second photograph, uh, you only see the, the, the two sons. But in the first one, in the background, there are a few other characters. And I've just got a slide here mentioning the characters that we have in the Rembrandt painting. Of course, the three main characters are the prodigal son, the younger, the elder son. These are all part of the story and the, and the compassionate father. There are a number of other characters in Luke's parable. We have the servants and, of course, you have the fatted calf. Uh, <laughs> and in Rembrandt's painting, you have some dark figures in the background, and we don't know who they are. They seem to be kind of bystanders, and I don't know what, what exactly to do with that, except to say that in every gospel story, there are lots of people sitting as bystanders. They just sit there and sort of stare into the future and don't seem to know much about or care much about what's happening in, in the actual story where the gospel, the grace, is entering into the life of the younger son and being resisted by the older son and being overwhelmingly and powerfully conveyed by the father. And the three people in the dark are just sitting by and uh, looking, looking into, the, into, the, into space as if nothing was happening. And, you know, again, maybe a parable of our day when we think about the fact that the most powerful and, and moving story that the world has ever known, the story of God's grace in Christ Jesus, which we just celebrated with a communion, how does most of the world respond? They sit in the dark and look into space as if nothing was happening. And Rembrandt's got three figures, two of them women and one man, who in the painting seem to fit into that category. Well, uh, let's go to the, to the story itself. The story itself involves three sections. The, I call it the story of the prodigal, the story of the elder brother, and the story of the father. And some verses that we're going to read that fit into each. Now for the text itself, for the reading of scripture, I, I've broken it down into sections of Luke 15 of, of this particular parable, and we'll put it up on the screen in English and Chinese, and Betsy's going to read them section by section, and I'll give a brief comment. The first section, which is the first two verses, verses 12 and 13, I tell the story of the choice that was made by the younger son. And we'll comment on that, but uh, let's hear the story about the younger son and his choice. The Beth? younger one said to his father. Can you turn the microphone on? Oh, doesn't seem to be working. Okay, go ahead. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So... He divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Again, it's a very familiar story to most of us. <clears throat> the younger son uh, asks for his inheritance, and what's an amazing part of the story is that the old man just gets out his checkbook and writes off half of his property. You know, here, here, here are all my stocks. I'll keep the bonds and you can take the whole business. The old man, I think, uh, keeps the debt <laughs> to go back to an earlier theme today. Um, but he gives half of his property to the son and just sends him off. And the kid squanders it all on, uh, on wild living, riotous living, as the King James says. 
Well, it doesn't turn out very well. And the next couple of verses continue the story. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Well, the young man realizes it hasn't turned out very well, and he thinks about the fact that he's in dire straits, and there's a famine in the country, and he's separated himself from his family, and he doesn't know what kind of a reception he would receive were he to return to his father. But he also knows that his father's servants have more than enough to eat, and he says to himself, I'm going to get up. It, the scripture says he came to his senses. And he says, I'm going to get up and go back. And then he comes up with a deal that he thinks maybe he can sell to his father. He is going to go back trying to be one of the servants, but there's more than that because he actually goes back knowing that he isn't one of the servants. But he hopes that his father, who's already given him half of the inheritance, that his father will welcome him back and make a deal with him, and he'll at least be able to have food. So let's continue the story. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? To spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. <laughs> now, the story takes a fresh turn at this point, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's one of the world's favorite stories. Turns out that the, the old father has had his eyes out. I don't know whether he... He had servants who were sort of keeping an eye on who came in, but the father, while the son is still a long way off, uh, gets word of the fact that he's coming, sets out to find him. The son comes, he's got his prepared speech, and we'll see how it works out. Okay? So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now at that point, the son's prepared speech stops in the middle. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but you know the last line, make me as one of your hired servants never seems to come out in terms of what, the, what the, the young guy, the kid, has prepared to say. And that, of course, is the whole deal. As we know, going back to the, what we've read earlier in the story, the whole point was that I'm going to make a deal with Dad, and we'll, I'll be like one of his hired servants, and at least I'll have three square meals a day, and I'll promise a few things, and he'll give me a deal. And he and I will work out uh, some way in which I can re-earn my place in the family and I can be restored to at least some of the privileges of being in the family if I only repent enough, if I promise enough, and if I work hard enough, and if my dad is willing to make a deal with me. So he gets partway through the speech, and the speech ends. It seems almost as if the father having heard the first part of the speech, interrupts the kid and says something that changes the tone of the whole story. Next. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it, let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The father, as it turns out, has no interest in making a deal with his son. 
Because the Father isn't about deal-making. Getting back to the Father when we've sinned is not about going back and offering enough of our righteousness so that the Father will sort of break down some of the resistance he has to us and kind of let us back as long as we keep all the rules. That's not what the whole thing is about. And the story, the Father breaks into the deal-making, sweeps it all aside, and says, look, it's always been about grace. It's always been about my gift. It has nothing to do with what you're going to come back here and do for me. It has to do with what I am going to do for you. And now, my son, because you've come back, uh, and remember, he's thrown his arms around him. He's kissed him. He's uh, told the servants, go and get the best robe, get a ring and put it on his finger. And uh, furthermore, sandals on his feet, but let's kill the fatted calf and let's have a big party because my son was dead and is now alive. He was lost and he's found. So that's the story of the prodigal son himself. And again, remember our focus is on the father, so we want to take from this some things about the father. Well, let's go back to the painting, and now I want you to look at the figure on the right, the tall, uh, austere figure who is looking down his nose at the proceedings. Again, this is Rembrandt. This isn't an exact representation of what happens in the, in the story itself. But this is how Rembrandt puts it all together as part of his sermon to us. So the elder brother is portrayed as arms folded. It's actually a bit down further, but well-dressed, uh, always fits in. When you go to church, you put on a tie, etc. Everything's got to be right. And he's looking down his nose at the sinner. Who is this son of yours who wasted his substance with prostitutes? And that's the attitude of the elder brother. And he's initially drawn into the story because the party has begun. Let's read the story. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now one of the problems with religious people, and I've been sort of a religious person all my life, I guess I was raised in it, went to church, I don't know how many times a week we went to church when I was a kid, but we <coughs> counted them out. We never had a check checklist to say we've been to church this many times, but we knew. We weren't like those people out there. We, we went to church, we kept all the commandments, we, uh, we didn't drink or smoke or chew or go out with girls that did. And uh, we, were, we were the kind of people who could identify a little more with the elder brother. Now, now and in his book, by the way, has a wonderful chapter starting out with identifying with the younger son uh, who rebelled against grace. But then he goes on and he says, you know, I think I've been more the older son. <laughs> I look at my own life and I say I probably have, even though I, I can identify with the younger son, I can identify in many ways more with the older son because, I mean, he was a Roman Catholic priest and a person who, um, who lived, as far as we know, a very, very righteous life. And like most of us who are regular churchgoers and longtime Christians, lifetime Christians, we generally have avoided the extremes of evil. We know that we're sinners. The scripture reminds us of that. But when I was a little kid, I remember uh, some of the pictures of, gro of grave sin. And as a five-year-old, I had trouble identifying with that because I knew I'd been a naughty boy. It wasn't that point. But uh, when I heard about all these extremes of sin, I realized that neither I nor my family had ever fit into that category. And I grew up with the experience, my own personal experience, being more that of the elder brother. And one of the problems with being a religious person is that we tend easily to forget the fact that none of our religion has earned us any favor in the Lord's sight. Because God isn't the deal maker who's out there offering eternal life in return for our good works. Instead, God is the God who delights to give. He gives half of inherit his inheritance to the kid who's going off to waste it. 
and we'll find out in the story that the other half of his inheritance, he's also given away. That's what he's like. So the older son hears what's going on, and he refuses to go in. At that point, the father gets wind of it, and the story picks up. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. <laughs> the New Testament is full of, especially the Gospels, is full of stories that illustrate this same point. I think of the parable of the laborers, you know, the laborers that are hired at the beginning of the day and they work in the, the, the heat of the day. And I've lived in the Middle East, Betsy and I had a year in Israel. And the, the hot sun beats down and there's no mercy from it. You work through the heat of the day and you've, you've had eight or nine or 10 hours because they didn't have eight hour days at that time. And then the master goes out in the middle of the day, finds a few, uh, a few guys hanging around the marketplace, hires them. And at, at the end of the day, when there's only an hour left, he goes out, finds a few more hanging around the marketplace, he hires them. And at the end of the day, he starts by paying off the guys that have worked all day, and he pays them the day's wages that he offered. Gave them what they'd earned. They were the religious people who had earned their salvation, and they got paid. Then comes the people hired in the middle of the day, and especially the people hired at the end of the day. And lo and behold, he ends up giving them exactly the same amount that he had given to the first people. And the first people, who really believe in earning your salvation, they believe in work salvation, to put it into a theological concept, they're infuriated because the master gives to the people who only worked one hour the same amount that he gave to the people that had worked 10 hours. Again, it's the same thing with the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross had been a murderer and a thief, and at the very last minute, Jesus says, today, you're gonna to be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross had done absolutely nothing to merit that pouring out of grace from our Lord on the cross. All he had done was repent and plead with Jesus for mercy today, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says, today you're gonna to be with me in paradise. Now what happens is that whenever any kind of deal making comes into the story in the New Testament or anywhere in the, in the Old or New Testament, when you get to the point where any of us think we can earn our way into God's favor, the narrative interrupts that and brings in a note of grace. Grace always ends up triumphing. And so the last part of it um, is uh, the, what have we read, how far have we read, Betts? John to 31. To 31. The last part of it, I actually should call the father's story. I've called it here the verses 31 and 32. I've called it the elder brother's story, but it's really now it's the father's story. And look how the father, interrupts the narrative of the older son as he had interrupted the narrative of the younger son. And instead of allowing works in both cases, the younger son wanted a deal and the older son thought he had a deal. And the father says, in neither case can either of you have a deal because I'm all about grace and all about generosity. And so this is the father's last word. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And I wondered as I read that and as I've thought about it, how many of us who have been pretty religious most of our lives, <clears throat> deep down in our hearts, we really think we've earned God's favor. Yes, we accepted the grace of God when we were saved back at earlier in our life, 
But then, after being saved, we spend our lives working. And we think that we've been able, because we've been doing the stuff that we know God wants us to do. But it's instead of it becoming working in light of grace, it becomes working in light of legal requirements. It becomes legalism rather than grace. And so when this kind of thing happens and God reminds us that his grace is unlike anything the world has ever known and his grace is utterly dominant in the gospel story and there's nothing we can do to change it and we suddenly discover that God interrupts our narrative and says, you didn't earn anything. All the way along, everything I've ever had is yours. I've given you everything in Christ Jesus and now you've spent 40 years working for me. God bless you. I love it. You've served faithfully and thank you for that. I'm going to reward you for that. But don't think that that changes the fact that I started out by giving you everything because I gave you my son and in Jesus I gave you everything. That's something I think as religious people we need to remind ourselves of every day of our life. And the elder brother is a good reminder to all of us of that. Well, the father wants grace to triumph. Well, let's finish up by uh, looking again back to Rembrandt's portrait. The father. Let's talk about the father a bit. And here's a portrait of the father, just the father and the son. And Rembrandt has made much of the father's compassion in his painting. And it's, it's those aspects that I want to finish with. Now, Henry Nouwen listed three things that he saw that went into making up the compassion of the father in the story. And I want to go over now in three points because I think they're worth considering. The first point he makes is that the father understood the pain that he experienced as he reflected on the pain that his sons experienced. When you listen to the father's dialogue with both of the sons, with the first son, the father has struggled with the son's being gone all those years. The son was dead. He lost his son. And now the son is alive. And he knows that the son, when he sees him and dressed in rags and he comes back desperate for his life, the father's heart goes out to him. But it's been going out all the years that he's been gone. The father feels the distance. He feels the dissoluteness of the son and his wandering, and the father, his heart is with the errant son all of those years. And when he sees him afar off, he goes out and he throws his arms around him and hugs him and kisses him and he says, oh, my son, my son, my son. Likewise with the older son. The father isn't, uh, uh, isn't simply upset with the son's attitude, he's grieved by the son's attitude because they're having a party and the son won't come in and the son then has a screwy theology. He says, look, I've worked for you all my life and you're not rewarding me. Instead, you throw it off to this, this kid that wasted all your substance on pro prostitutes. And the father says, look, everything that I have is yours. And the son says, but you never even gave me a goat. What do you mean gave you a goat? The goats all belong to you. Why weren't you celebrating? And instead the son was so busy working for the father that he couldn't even experience a little bit of celebration. And that again is a message to us to remember. By God's grace, all things have been given to us. So the father shared the grief. The second thing now and says is that the father forgave unreservedly. No matter what the son had done in either case, rebelling against grace or resisting grace, in both cases, the father said, forget that. You've repented of it, come into the party. Now, the first son was able to come into the party because he had repented. The second son, the tragedy is, as far as we know in the story, the older son never repented of resisting grace and stayed out of the party. We hope it isn't that way. But whatever it is, the father forgave unreservedly. And thirdly, the father gives generously beyond measure. We've already mentioned the fact that between the two sons, the father had given everything away. So those are three points now and makes, and I want to finish with a couple of points that I make myself. Uh, this is the, uh, 
the, the, the three points I would build a sermon around if I were building a whole sermon on this, and this is just the ki tiny end of what we're doing here. The first one that I was struck with was the fact that the Father is a seeking Father. The Father comes after us, not we after the Father. And I think that's an important point. And he comes after both sons. It's not only the prodigal son, but the father comes out of the house and goes looking for the elder son as well. And no matter who you are today, wherever you are in life, I want you to know that right now God the Father is looking for you. He's looking for me. And if we have found ourselves distant from him in any way, whether we've never accepted the Lord and come into his grace, or whether we're resisting his grace in some aspect of our lives, the Father is out there wanting to welcome us. He's a seeking Father. And the scripture reminds us that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the second point that I've thought about is the, the um, giving Father. And again, we've covered this, I think, sufficiently, but every time I ponder how much God has given, I find myself drawn into the mystery, the awe of the fact that he has given everything. This is one of the things in this parable that actually surprises me when I've thought about it. I have stuff that Betsy and I have collected over a lifetime. We call it our estate. I carefully guard that estate. We have some stocks and bonds. We have some real estate. We have property. We want to leave some to our kids. And I remind my kids when they want a little bit of it right now that mom and I have to keep an eye on the estate because if we deplete it too rapidly, we won't have anything to live on and you won't have anything to inherit. So we don't give it all away. By contrast, the father in this story gave away half of it to the first son and tells the second son, I've given it all to you. It's everything is yours. And I thought of that verse in Romans that says, uh, and I've, I've quoted that verse here on the, uh, on, the, on the screen. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not freely with him give us and what does it say? All things. God has actually given us in Christ Jesus everything he has to give. He hasn't held a bit back. And you and I today, as people who are in Christ, we have received all the goodness of God and the idea that we can complain to God, you never gave me a kid to celebrate with my front sons. You never gave me this, you never gave me that. God says, no, wait a minute. I gave you my son, Jesus Christ. I have given you all things. I haven't anything more to give because I've already given it to you. All things are yours in Christ. And that generosity of the Father in and through his son, Jesus Christ, is one of the great themes of scripture. And then finally, the celebrating Father. And I love this, that the father says, look, whether you're a rebel returning from the far country or whether you're a religious person who's been resisting grace, I want you to quit. Forget it. Lay down your tools. Come home. Let's put on the best robe. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate as we did this morning at the Lord's table. And God is running a major party celebrating what he has done for us whether we're the rebel younger son or whether the resistant older son, God's grace is there and all we need to do is come into the party. And the invitation this morning is come and celebrate, come into the party. And so uh, when we think about, and I've added a scripture there from the Psalms that talks about God pouring out pleasure, pleasure forevermore, and God wants us to celebrate with him. Well, how do we do this? Um, how do we find the Father heart of God? Well, I've got a slide here that says three things, three questions. Where do we look for the Father heart of God or where do we express the Father heart of God as we find it? Right here, in the church, in the neighborhood, 
in our workplace, in our family, with our kids, if we're, if we're parents, with our parents, if we're kids. That's where we take the Father heart of God, the things we've learned about God, and we bring them to a world that's desperate for fathers, de desperate for the kind of fathers we talked about today. When do we do it? Or where do we do it? Really, we've answered, the same, answered that question. And finally, how do we do it? This is what I want to finish with, and I'm actually finishing this time. <laughs> I know I said I was finishing, but I want you to listen to this verse from 2 Corinthians 3. It's in a passage that talks about Moses having a veil over his face and the Jews still not being able to see things openly because they have a veil over their face, even when scripture is read. But in Christ, Paul says, the veil is removed, and you and I are able to perceive spiritual realities in Christ because the veil is gone. And when we observe spiritual realities without the veil, what do we see? And that's what's in this verse. And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the, glory, the Lord's glory. We, at the same time, are being transformed into his increasing glory, uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, which comes through the Lord, and it says that this all comes to us by the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so today, this morning, our task is not only to be one of the sons and come back, but our task also is to be fathers and mothers, to be the kind of godly fathers and mothers that can take the father heart of God and we can, with unveiled faces, contemplate in Christ the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into that image from glory to glory, or as the, as the NIV says, with increasing glory. And how does this happen? It all comes from the Lord, and it comes through his spirit. So if we want to make a difference this week in Ladner and Tawasin and wherever the Lord calls us, the thing we can do in order to make a difference and communicate the Father heart of God is to imagine, to uh, envisage, to contemplate with unveiled faces the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that as we do, we in turn will be transformed into his image from glory to glory. And the Lord will do that in our lives if we will just let him. That's the story of grace, and it's worth celebrating. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you for these simple stories that convey so much. We thank you for people like Rembrandt, who uh, 400 years ago uh, put down things on canvas that convey to us powerful spiritual realities. We thank you for writers like Henry Nouwen, who have so... Uh, so convincingly told the story of grace. And we thank you right now, this morning, that we have experienced the story of grace, and we pray that we might go from this place being transformed from glory to glory into the image of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, for his name's sake. Amen.